I invite you to take your Bibles once more and turn to the New Testament to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, this morning we'll give our attention to verses 37 to 39. John chapter 7, beginning in verse 37, I remind you that this is God's word, inspired, inerrant, and infallible. So let us give our attention to its reading. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. The rest withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, As we continue our study together of John's Gospel, here in chapter 7, we are in the midst of those festival days, the festival cycle that began in chapter 5 with the Sabbath and will continue on to the Passover. As we have worked our way through these festivals, we have seen this chapter focus our attention on on the festival of booths, tabernacles, or more commonly referred to as Sukkot was that eight-day feast that commemorated God's provision and His care for His people within the wilderness. You'll find more about this in Leviticus chapter 23 in that Old Testament book beginning in verse 34. We hear God saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of this seventh month, and for seven days is the feast of booths to the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. For seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. Then in verse 41 it says, You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So here in in John chapter 7, what we've seen is how Jesus is is taking part in this festival. And there's been a tension that's been building in this chapter. Remember at the very beginning, Jesus was tested by his brothers to go and to make himself known. Along with this was the hunt for him by the Pharisees, as well as the expectations of the people as they were trying to force Jesus into a mold of their own making. We saw this especially last week, if you remember, as they misjudged Jesus. They misjudged his origin, seeing him as only earthly and not as one who was sent from heaven. They misjudged his works as they focused on the signs, rather on looking beyond the signs to the thing they signified, or rather, to the one they signified. And they misjudged his destination. Remember there at the end of our passage last week, Jesus was talking about going away, and where he would go, they could not follow. And so they asked, does he mean to go to the dispersion? You see, they misunderstood that Jesus was going to be taken from them because he was going to be handed over by them. He was going to be glorified. What we've noticed throughout this chapter and indeed throughout John's Gospel is what one makes of Jesus makes all the difference. Jesus made clear that he was going to heaven when they were not because they rejected him. He is at the center of the story Whether we're in the Old Testament looking forward or the New Testament epistles looking backward, it all points to the work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so in our text this morning, we come to the last day, to the great day of the feast and Jesus' proclamation and his offer. And these verses, and we're covering only a few verses this morning because there is so much here. But here he speaks of water. He speaks of thirst. And then he connects water 
and life. And John connects for us water and spirit. And so spirit and life. Make no mistake, the offer that Jesus makes in our passage this morning is one that continues to be made. Come to him and drink. Before we look at our text, then I want to think a little bit about water in Scripture. You see, water has a prominent place in Scripture. There in the very beginning in creation, when God made everything, and it was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. That chaotic deep that in every other creation story was uncontainable. God, by His Spirit, hovers, flutters over it, controls it. It was out of that water that God would bring forth life. The water would play a prominent role also as creation moved on and as God planted a garden in Eden in the east. And he put a river there to flow out of Eden to water the garden. He divided into those four great rivers. Water flowing out of the presence of God, if you will. Water flowing out of that garden tabernacle, that garden temple. But of course, as they were cast out of the garden, they were cut off from that water. They were cut off from the water of life that was there in the presence of God. And this was signified for them in the fact that water now becomes dangerous. We think of the flood waters in Noah. Or we think about the lack of water in the wilderness. In Exodus chapter 17, when God commands Moses to strike the rock and water will come out of it in order to provide life for the people. For without that water, they would die. That water in the Old Testament would continue to take on a significance of coming from the presence of God. His city, the river whose streams make glad the city of God. Psalm 46 and verse 4. God Himself is seen as a fountain of water in Psalm 36 and in Jeremiah 17 perhaps more specific to our text this morning, is during this festival of booths, certain passages of Scripture would be read having to do with water. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 8 and 9, we read, On that day living water shall flow out of Jerusalem. Or Isaiah 12, verses 2 and 3, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song. He is... Become, he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. You see, these passages, especially Isaiah 12 and Zechariah 14, became part of the, the, the water, uh, uh, um, the, the festival of booths, and particularly the water march, if you will. They would come, the priest would come and would draw water out of the pool of Shalom, and they would walk it there into the altar and pour it on top of the altar. And they would do this every single day until the last day. The great day of the feast. And on that day, they would no longer go just once. But rather, they would repeat it seven times. Seven times the priest would come out with a golden pitcher filled with water from the pool of Shalom, carry it around the altar. And along the way, another priest would come around. After his sixth time, he'd be joined with a priest carrying wine to offer this food offering or the drink offerings to be poured out. They would ascend the ramp to the altar where they would together pour out the water and the wine. When they were in place, there would be a pause as the priest would raise up his pitcher, seemingly as high as he could go. And always the crowd shouted for him to hold it even higher. And so he would do that. And it was considered to be the height of joy in a person's life if he could see the water being poured onto the altar even once in his life. It was a solemn moment you could imagine, even as that moment would be hushed before the shouts as the priests brought the water and reminded the people of the hope that they have for the great salvation that God would one day bring, signified by that water. That one day, water would flow out of that garden temple again. That water would flood, not in a judging kind of way, but in a way of salvation. And it's in that moment that Jesus stands up at that feast. Jesus stands up on the great day as the water will be poured out 
and he shouts at the top of his lungs. You see, the word that is used here is that he stood up and he cried out. It's a word that's used to, to describe someone's cry for help. It can also be translated as shrieking or screaming. It's loud. It's meant to get the attention of anyone with an earshot. And Jesus calls out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Well, there's so much going on in these verses and we want to understand it carefully. Notice first God's grace in Christ. Now for this, we need to step back and think about what Jesus has done up to this point. He's already gone to the temple. He's already taught. He's already answered questions. He's already done many miracles. He's been rejected by so many. And you could imagine in that moment, it would be easier just to walk away. The grace of God in Christ is that he shouts out at just that moment. We also sense the urgency of his call. You see, Jesus doesn't walk up to random individuals knowing, of course, that he's omniscient and he could do that. He could walk up to each person who was to receive the Spirit and simply say, you come follow me and quietly slink away. But no, he stands up and he shouts. There's an urgency to his call. It's an offer of salvation to all who would hear. He's made the quiet offer already to the woman at the well. The same offer that, uh, of living water. There's a time for a quiet offer. There's a time for a plea. And there's a time for a cry. And so Jesus cries out. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Now, perhaps we have difference of opinion on this, but, but, but in, my, in my thinking, in my imagination, if you will, the moment Jesus does this is that moment where the priest is holding up the water before the, before the crowd would shout to hold it higher. Or maybe even as the water itself is poured, it's connected, though, with that water. You can imagine how the ritual had become commonplace. It signified salvation, but at this point, it would be more of a show. But Jesus calls out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. <sighs> J.C. Ryle comments on this. He says, the thirst before us is of a purely spiritual kind. It means anxiety of soul, conviction of sin, desire of pardon, longing after peace of conscience. When a man feels his sins and wants forgiveness, is deeply sensible of his soul's need and earnestly desires help and relief. It's as the psalmist cries out in Psalm 42, as the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Notice that Jesus gives a general invitation. If anyone thirsts, whoever it might be, Jesus calls to them. Whether it is one of high status or low status, of rich or poor, young or old, let him come. And notice it's also a specific invitation. Let him come to me, Jesus says. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, Jesus says in Matthew 11 and verse 28. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no bunny, m money, come, buy and eat, Isaiah 55 and verse 1. In the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament, then the focus is on the salvation of God to come to Him. And the truth is, beloved, is that this thirst exists in all of us. And yet it's a kind of thirst that many will mistake for something else. The truth is that so many will satisfy their thirst with anything except Christ. Again, J.C. Ryle says this, such thirst as this, unhappily, is known by few. All ought to feel it, and all would feel it if they were wise, sinful, mortal, dying creatures as we all are, with souls that will one day be judged and spend eternity in heaven or hell. There lives not a man or woman on earth who ought not to thirst after salvation, and yet the many thirst after everything almost except salvation. Money pleasure, 
honor, rank, self-indulgence. These are the things which they, which they desire. There is no clearer proof of the fall of man and the utter corruption of human nature than the careless indifference of most people about their souls. No wonder the Bible calls the natural man blind, asleep, dead. And so few can be found who are awake, alive, who thirst for salvation. But that doesn't stop Jesus, of course, from crying out. The offer that Jesus makes is a sincere, well-meant offer to come to Him. And He goes on to make a promise. Whoever believes in Me, Jesus says, the open invitation to come to Jesus is to believe in Him, to have faith in Jesus. He is the object of our faith. Remember in Exodus 17, when Moses struck the rock and water came out, and later in Numbers 20, when Moses, when Moses struck the rock twice instead of commanding it, God condemns Moses because he did not believe. And Jesus shows us that he is the one who was upon the rock. He is the one who was struck. We believe in him in order to receive the salvation he speaks of, in order to receive that, 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 that thirst, that, 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 to have our thirst quenched. For he is the object of our faith. Jesus will say in John 14 and verse 1, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. We're to believe in Christ. To believe what he says. To believe who he is. To believe what he has done. What he has accomplished for us and for our salvation. This belief then is a personal trust in God. Psalm 27, verses 13 and 14, we read, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. This faith in Jesus Christ, this belief in Jesus is what is offered each and every Lord's day, each and every time we open our scriptures, each and every time we call out to Him in prayer to believe in Jesus. But this is the basis of our salvation, faith in Jesus Christ. As Abraham believed the Lord and it was counted to him as righteousness, Habakkuk says that the righteous shall live by his faith. And Paul says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. To believe in Jesus then, to have faith in Him, to submit ourselves to what He teaches, to submit to His training in righteousness, to submit to His Word, to come to Him as the fountain of living waters and the giver of all comfort. For a sinner who thirsts has only to cast his soul upon Christ, to trust Him, to lean on Him, to believe in Him, to commit his soul with all its burdens to him. That is what we are called to do. You see, to trust Christ is to come to Christ. If anyone believes in me, Jesus says, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. As, I read, as we read this passage, you might have thought to yourself, what scripture is Jesus citing here? It's not immediately clear that it's one passage. There are attempts by scholars or uh, other pastors, maybe even as you've worked through these text verses yourself, to try to find that one verse. I don't think there's one verse that Jesus is talking about. Instead, I think he's looking at, at the entirety of Scripture, the entirety of the Old Testament, and the promise of, of water that God provides, and that connection between water and life that we see throughout the Old Testament whether we're in creation, in the garden, in the wilderness, or waiting for Christ, that salvation is pictured as water. Now you can likely understand why Israel, particularly Jerusalem and that surrounding region, it was an arid, dry, desert land. Water was necessary. Without water, you would die 
Without water, you, you, you would not be able to go about your ordinary day. They would send people to the well. They would send people to the rivers in order to bring water back. It was so necessary. We understand this, I'm sure, at, at, a, at a very basic level. We know that we need to drink. In fact, perhaps one of our struggles is that we have an abundance and so we can go without water for so long, or at least it seems so long. But trust me, for you to truly go without water, your body would suffer, your mind would break down. And so God provides water in the Old Testament. He provides it for his people. He promises that he will continue to provide water and indeed that one day he will provide so much water that it will flow out of the center of his own presence. This flowing water then is a symbol of God's provision. It's what we see in Ezekiel 47. If you read Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48, it's that picture of, of, of the new temple being built after the destruction of the old temple and the water is said to grow in, in its deepness. It's also employed in the last chapter of Revelation, a river with the tree of life. And so Jesus really cites all of Scripture, reminding us of everything that we've thought about thus far, about the importance of water and the promise that He is the one who quenches that thirst. And the way that He does it is in such a way that it overflows. Now there's a bit of a question here as to the meaning of His words. Out of His heart will flow rivers of living water. And depending on who you read, it'll, be, it'll give you a different answer. In other words, whose heart is being spoken of here? Is it the people who drink? Is it their heart? That is, that if you come to Jesus, then you would overflow with His mercy and goodness, with salvation to abundance. For He is the fountain of living water. And so we can say with the psalmist that you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Or is this speaking of the Messiah Himself? This could make sense with the connection to Ezekiel 47 and Revelation 22. For He is the one that we believe in and He is the one who provides for us. He is the one who is the fountain of living water. Indeed, when we find ourselves parched and thirsty, when we find ourselves in need, we come again to Christ to be filled. And for my part, I'm not sure that we have to decide between whether it's specifically and only speaking of Jesus or speaking of those who would come to Him. I don't think it's an either-or situation, for we come to Christ as the one who provides living waters for us, and yet, as we drink up Christ, He wells up in us. As Jesus tells the woman at the well in John 4, verses 13 to 14, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. That is the water from the well. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty forever. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And so this is the way that I see it, is that Jesus is, is speaking of the, of the superabundance of the goodness of the gospel, the promise of the Spirit that he will give. Make no mistake, we're going to make this transition in a moment, but it's not without reason that the Spirit is poured out upon the church. Water is that which is poured out. The Spirit is poured out. You see, beloved, this passage calls us then to come to Christ. And that call is to us this morning. Whether we have come to Christ before or we have not come to Christ, we continually return to our Savior Jesus, for He is the one who, who, who is that fountain of living water. It is in Him that we live and move and have our being. It is, in, it is to Him that we turn and we are filled again and again and again. For we are much like the saints of old, wandering around in this wilderness of a world, parched, struggling, discouraged. And Christ gives Himself and this is what I love about John 7 is here in this moment as the people were waiting and some were waiting in sincerity, others were going through the motions, but there's Jesus standing up and saying, all that you've been waiting for, all that you desire, all that you long for is found in me. 
Und so kam. Make no mistake, Jesus is making a promise here. He is saying that if you come to him, he will fill you. If you trust yourselves to him, he will care for you. And so we see the offer that Jesus makes. We see the promise that he makes. And lastly, we see the note that John makes in our gospel. He says in verse 39, now this he said about the Spirit. You'll notice, of course, that it's capital S, Spirit. I'm speaking of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. Not an impersonal force. Not some, you know, ambiguous sort of thing that is poured out or that is given, but rather the one who is with us, the one who cares for us. This is why Jesus could promise when he would depart that he would not leave us or forsake us. Because he would give his Spirit. And so we remember the closeness also of water and life and spirit in the scriptures. For water symbolizes in the scriptures the work of the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel chapter 36. In verses 25 to 27 we read, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put, in, put within you. That will give you the heart of stone. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will pour my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. This is the promise of God in the Old Testament. And what Jesus says here in John chapter 7 is that it will be affected by him when he is glorified. The spirit will be poured out. This is what the Apostle Paul is, is, is tapping into in Titus chapter 3, which we heard in our assurance of forgiveness. When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. This is why, by the way, baptism is of such significance to us. Not because it does something in and of itself as though by itself it operates, by itself it automatically, uh, magically transforms, but rather through faith and by the working of the Holy Spirit, it signifies and seals to us that washing away of our sins. The regeneration, the renewal, the new heart. For we confess that not only are we a people who are parched, living in the wilderness of a world, but a people who are stained, dirty with sin. And the good news of Jesus Christ, as he offers himself, as he says, come to him for those living waters, is that we are not only quenched in our thirst, but washed of our sins. And John continues to say here about the Spirit. He said this about the Spirit whom those who believed in Him were to receive. And John is pointing forward, of course, because Jesus will leave. He will depart. And we read in John chapters 14 and 16 that He's going to send His Helper. He's going to send the Holy Spirit. And indeed, even as Jesus prepares to depart in John chapter 20, he breathes on them and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. There is then an inseparable connection between faith in Jesus Christ and receiving the Holy Spirit. If any man has faith, then he has the Spirit. If anyone does not have the Spirit, then he has no saving faith in Jesus Christ. And the evidence of having the Spirit, we can say from our text, is in fact belief in Jesus. For as John will say in his first epistle, that no one can say, Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. In this way, the work of the second and third persons of the Godhead is never divided. In other words, you can't have those people who believe in Jesus but have not received the Spirit. You cannot have those who have received the Spirit but do not believe in Jesus. No one believes in Jesus except by the work of the Spirit within them. 
The Apostle Paul again connects this with, with water in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. For he, he says, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So John says that, he, that, that Jesus is speaking of the Spirit, that is, that, that, that the fountain of living waters, the way in which He's going to pour Himself out is going to be through the Spirit. And He says, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And here John tells us then how it will be that we'll be washed with the Spirit. Christ will be crucified and raised up to glory. But this means that the Holy Spirit was not yet poured out on believers in His fullness because our Lord had not yet finished His work. He had not died, been raised to new life, ascended into heaven and sent His Spirit. It was not until He would be glorified by going up into heaven and taking His seat at the right hand of the Father that the Holy Spirit was sent down in full measure on the church. We read of this, of course, in Acts chapter 2. Indeed, in Acts 2, we find the fulfillment of what Jesus is speaking of here. And that fulfillment reverberates throughout church history such that if anyone comes to Jesus, they receive the same Holy Spirit. Now, I would encourage you to consider reading Acts 2 a bit later. Acts 2, there we read of, of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, the tongues of fire that rested upon each of those disciples that was there, and Peter proclaiming the message boldly. And what I love about that moment is that as Jesus or as Peter proclaims the message, it creates thirst. For after he is done, after he tells the people that they're the ones who crucified the Lord of glory, what they say is, brothers, what shall we do? You see, they weren't even aware of their own thirst until that moment. They weren't even aware of their own thirst until the Spirit had been poured out upon the church, until, until the people had, had bubbled over, if you will, with, with, with that living water. And there, those who were unbelievers understood that they themselves were thirsty. What shall we do? Jesus offers living waters even this day. He calls us to come and to drink. He calls us to trust, to entrust ourselves to Him. And so in closing, I want to consider briefly the grace of Jesus' words here. For the promise of His words is astounding. For He tells us that if we believe in Him, if we come to Him, He will give. This is not a hunt where we move from clue to clue, never reaching the end of our journey. It is not a quest where we must prove ourselves worthy of His companionship or of His mercy. He gives His presence by His Spirit to all who come to Him. Do you thirst for Christ? Come, drink, and be filled. Let Him satisfy you in this wilderness of a world just as He satisfied the saints of old as the rock who followed them, as we read in 1 Corinthians 10. Indeed, Jesus still offers Himself. Indeed, the Scriptures close. Revelation 22 and verse 17, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. For God's Spirit still cleanses and fills His people. The Apostle Paul teaches us in Ephesians 1 verses 13 and 14. All the promises of the Old Testament then come to fulfillment in Jesus. Isaiah 41 verses 17 to 18 we read, When the poor and needy seek water and there is none and their tongue is parched with thirst, I the Lord will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. Isaiah 58 and verse 11, And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters 
do not fail. As we'll see in our, as we continue to study John's Gospel, as well as our knowledge of the rest of Scriptures and our own lives, drinking just this once is not the end. For we live in this wilderness of a world. We run a race of life that leaves us parched and dry. And so Jesus calls us to drink of Him and His Word in the sacraments and in prayer. Do not neglect these things in the same way that you wouldn't neglect a cup of water in the middle of a long race. Or if you did, it would be to your detriment. Come to Jesus. Drink. Drink.